important to us. I just want to um, acknowledge my good friend and brother, um, Bobby Powell, who has was, was stood the storm, amen? And, and um, he's been come out on the other side, representing the people and their agenda. Uh, my brother, Corey Nearing, who uh, represents the city very well. Uh, we bless God for his presence. And we always, always, uh, for the contribution that Indelible Mark placed here in the city of West Palm Beach, we always recognize our commissioner, uh, whether she's in capacity or not, Sister Priscilla Taylor, and we thank God for uh, her and being here. Amen. Oh, yeah, I'm um, sorry, all of, huh? Commissioner James, yeah, I'm sorry, we got him. And now everybody in this, you know, when we packed in like this, I'm used to be able to kind of pinpoint what got Commissioner James in the house. Praise God for him. And, um, you know, when we had that gala award, it was my privilege to uh, give an award to Sister Shuler, who's here today on, in, in the church. Amen. Amen. She is the last one to let you down. Amen. Y'all get that on the way home. But <laughs> oh, praise God. But, but everybody, and I sincerely mean it, I'm not saying it as a form of hyperbole, but everyone is truly, truly important here in this place today and every day. Now, this month, our focus is new revelation. Amen? And I, I declare, if you've been in Bible study, we've been having an awesome Bible study focusing on... Uh, the book of Revelation and God's revelation for his people. Um, it's a very interesting topic, and uh, we're going to continue, but I'm going to take a small pause in the action, and I thank you for allowing me to do so. Um, the reason why is on uh, tomorrow we celebrate the King holiday, and I'm going to anticipate that some of you all are going to be doing your own things. So I'm tabling Bible study tomorrow. And, I will, and I'll have to table the two events that we have scheduled this week for the following week. First being official board meeting, I need to table that to the following week. And Wednesday night Bible study, I need to also, um, we're going to have it, it will be here, it will be under the leadership of Reverend Dr. Ronald Jones. But my portion where, we, where I gave you homework, I told you to read four, five, and six, and bring me my, the questions for today. You see how quiet it got right there? <laughs> Somebody hadn't been doing their homework. But whatever the case may be, the homework that was given and assigned, I want to table that <clears throat> for the following week also. Um, past, pastor has been asked to preach a revival series in Washington, D.C. this week. And <laughs> church say amen. Now, I, I just felt like I should be in Washington doing a revival this week. If I, was, if I was ever going to be invited to do a revival in Washington, D.C., I just felt like this was the week for it to be done. So I appreciate you letting me go to do that. And also this Saturday, Friday and Saturday, I'll be teaching and doing a workshop in Charleston, South Carolina. So I'm going to be traveling this week, so I'm going to have to postpone some of the things that I had scheduled to do with you. But we're going to pick all of them up on the following week. Amen? Amen. Amen. Now, hasn't the choir been wonderful today? Come on, let's bless the Lord for them. And they're going to come now and give us another selection, and then we'll hear a word from the Lord. Oh, wait, wait. Before they do that, I need to... I, I don't think the announcement was made that the ads for the ad booklet, there's been an extension granted to the 16th to turn in your ads. So all those who thought you might have missed the deadline... You can turn your ad, see Sister uh, Brittany Finley or uh, coordinator for the church anniversary, Sister Barbara Standard for McKenzie. Amen? Okay.
Amen. Will you touch and agree with your neighbor, repeating these words, bread of heaven, bread of heaven, feed us so that we will want no more. This is what we pray in the name of your precious, precious son, Jesus Christ's name. Amen. You, uh, I thank you for um, joining us today. Now, because we have so many guests, and I don't know where everyone is um, in terms of, yeah. <laughs> all right, so glad. So glad that you all are, be, are present physically, but I didn't want to preach anything too um, Disc, well, something that wasn't incongruent with where we've been in our studies of Revelation. Because for a lot of people, though it is the last and one of the most important and also one of the most recognizable books of the Bible, Revelations tends to strike a little bit of fear and intrepidation to those who don't come to Bible study very often. And so I don't, I'm not staring at anybody directly on that Bible study thing. But, you know, if you don't go, you just don't go. So a part of it is I want to still stay in line with Revelation, talk about Revelation, but I'm not going to do it from out of the book. Uh, amen? amen? But let's also agree that we should study this book at our own time. It's, it's, um, it's a very, I want to talk about the fact that Revelations is such a polarizing book, but for the, all of the things that are familiar that we get from the book of Revelations, we do not take enough time just to read it objectively for ourselves. Amen. The information that a lot of Christians get about the book of Revelations comes from horror movies and te television shows. People who've seen Poltergeist and The Omen and um, um, whatever the other kind of uh, cut em up slasher movies, that's what we get from the book of Revelations. We talk about someone coming with one foot on water and one foot on land, and we can recognize where that comes from. We talk about the mark of the beast and the antichrist, and we know where that comes from. But we, how many times do we sit down and go piece by piece and objectively look at the book it's in its literary form, fashion, and most importantly, in its literary intention? Who was the author? Have we questioned the authorship? Have we looked at the context on which they wrote it? And the reason why I ask these questions is because in most secular uh, writings and most secular uh, displays of artistic genius, we are very critical and break down every line in Shakespeare's plays. And we look at the context and what the backdrop was politically and socially as to why certain words mean what they mean. Okay, I lost somebody here. Um, but this is the same thing that we ought to do for the book of Revelation. Yeah. And the reason why is because there are a lot of things that unless you look at them objectively, you are going to misread, misinterpret, and most importantly, misunderstand. Yeah. The reason why this is important today is because in the text that we live this morning, Jesus talks about a new revelation. He talks about the fact that there were revelations that came before and that he was the fulfillment of those revelations. If you were stuck in the time of biblical antiquity between um, Genesis and the last book of the Old Testament, then your book of revelations would not be what we have, but your book of revelations might have been Isaiah or Jeremiah. Because Isaiah and Jeremiah spoke of the wickedness that would befall the people who turned away from God. And he talked very explicitly about the pains that the people of God would have to deal with, how they would be put in slavery and in bondage. And he gave vivid imagery that spoke to things that we could not conceptualize with our own mind, and yet we had to yield to allegory and imagination. But because they didn't sit, get to see the birth of Jesus. They never found out that the revelation that was given to them by Isaiah, it was manifested and it came true. They never saw that the one whom would be called Emmanuel actually was wrapped up in flesh and born in a manger. 
They never saw the fact that he did go from town to town healing the sick and raising the dead. And because they didn't see it, it didn't mean that the revelation was any less true. And Jesus, understanding that he was the revelation for somebody, he is careful to let people know that there are still more revelations to come. So join me really quickly in the 16th chapter, gospel recorded by John, and beginning at verse 12. Uh, it says, I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. And when the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth, for he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak. And he will declare to you the things that are to come, and he will glorify me, for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. All that the Father has is mine. Therefore, I said that he will take what is mine and declare it to you. A little while, and you will see me no longer. And again, a little while, you will see me. Some of his disciples said to one another, what is this he says to us? A little while, and you will not see me. And again, a little while, and you will see me. And because I am not going to the Father. So they were saying, what does he mean by a little while? We do not know what he is talking about. And Jesus knew that they wanted to ask him. So he said to them, is this what you are asking yourselves? What I meant by saying, a little while and you will not see me. And again, a little while you will see me. Truly, truly, I say unto you, you will weep and lament. You will be sorrowful, but your sorrow will turn into joy. Your sorrow will turn into joy. Now, Jesus is talking in a lot of ambiguous terms about what his future is. And as we all know from retrospect looking back, excuse me, from the present looking backward, we know exactly what he was talking about. He was telling his disciples that he was going on a cross to die and that they would not see him, but he would then be resurrected and then they would what? They would see him again. And so he was talking about his death, burial, and resurrection. In other words, he was telling them that there was still very much more to be revealed. Now, in the present for this particular um, message and pericope, we see that there are three different things about this revelation that we need to talk about today. Um, the first is the fact that for every great and major thing that God wants to reveal in our lives, there is a certain level of faith that we're going to have to be able to get it. All right. Um, God can reveal to you everything that he ever wants you to have, everything he ever wants you to accomplish, everything he ever wants you to gain. But if you don't have faith, you'll never go out and get it. It takes a certain level of faith. I hope somebody planned to help me today. Um, you, even if God for some reason outside of the will of this scripture that kind of goes against gambling, if God was to place the winning numbers in your Bible today, unless you believe God and had a certain, I thought I'd get you there. If you had enough faith to believe God, you wouldn't hit those numbers, nor would you have the faith to what? To play them. See, I got to come, I got to sit down next to some of y'all sometime. Because you got them losing numbers. Anyway, um, the, uh, the revelation that God gives is, is always met with a certain intention, but our faith has to match the intentions of what God wants for us. In religion and theology, revelation is the revealing or disclosing of some form of truth or knowledge through communication with a deity or other supernatural entity or entities. Some religions have religious texts which they view as divine or supernaturally revealed or inspired. This is a secular definition of what revelation is. But for us who believe in God by faith, we understand that revelation is much more than God's intervention in our lives. Sometimes God doesn't have to speak a revelation to us. He could just give it to us beyond the pardon of where we are. Sometimes God allows us to see things in people around us without them even saying their intentions or describing their motives. Sometimes God allows people to see other things in us 
without us having to go out and describe our intentions or providing our motives. Lord, have mercy today. Somebody's on a pew right now because God, anyway, uh, this is the problem here in the text is that we don't always understand what God's up to in the meaning, in the meaning of his revelation. God says, I want to show you things that's not going to break you out of bondage, but I want to show you something that's going to keep everybody in your family from going through the things that you went through. But unless you believe in me, I cannot reveal them to you. Um, we always look for God to do some kind of revealing. We always want God to be supernatural when we have a need for him to be supernatural. But it's not without our participation that God usually does these things. Now I want to describe a few things about what revelation is. Um, it is something that we cannot get for ourselves. And because it's something that we cannot get for ourselves, it's very similar to a gift. It's just, you know, some gifts we can get for ourselves, but it's, some, some things are better when others give it to us. Amen? Amen? You ever got a Christmas gift and you looked at that Christmas gift and said, I always wanted one of these, but I would never buy this for myself. Okay, yeah, no, it's just me. I had a good Christmas this year, so you have to excuse me. <laughs> um... But there are some things that we just cannot provide for ourselves. And revelation from God is specifically one of those things. Here in the revelation and the gift that God gives us, he has this intention to help us elevate ourselves to another level and to see things within the lifetime of Jesus Christ that we would not necessarily reveal, would not necessarily be revealed to us for ourselves. So this gift that God gives us, it has its own personality. It has its own kind of motive. It has its own agenda. It has its own type of context to it because this gift, it comes from Jesus for a specific purpose. Now, all the gifts and all the things that God's ever given you by way of his revelation, they were meant to serve you, but they were probably also meant to serve somebody else as well. That's why they came at the time in which they came. That's why they came in the place at which they came. That's when they came around the people that they came around because God had a certain personality in your revelation. So when God wants to reveal something to you in this season, watch the people who are around you during the revelation because God is trying to attach a personality to that gift. I know I'm losing some of you in here, but when we read these scriptures devoid of the personality of the scriptures, we lose what God is trying to say. I'm about to go back to the book of Revelation now. Many of us, the worst thing in the world is to see these three numbers in succession. Six, six. We end up driving across the street and we see somebody's mailbox say six. I ain't messing around. Because in our interpretation and in our mean, we've understood that the mark of the beast is 666. Never asking how they come up with this number, but only understanding that the Bible says that it's the number of man. The number of man is six, but the Bible uses 666. Never minding the fact that if we do our Bible research and we go and be good Bible scholars and we read what the Bible says. Now, John, who walked with Jesus, was give, has been given credit with the writing of the book of Revelation. But then there are others like John of Patmos and the heretic known as John who was exiled on the island of Patmos could have written the book of Revelation. And because we can go from one author to the other author, we can surmise that some prophets who had anti-political ties during that time, they spoke in numerical translations, meaning they would take the letters of the Greek name or the Hebrew name and they would add them up. So the letters Caesar Nero, who was a great persecutor of the Christians during that era, who, was ki who killed Paul and Peter himself, who was called the great demon amongst all leaders. His name in Greek translated to 1,005. But in Hebrew, each letter having their own assignment of numbers, 
the word Caesar Nero translates to 615. But for those who translate Hebrew, they put an extra N in the word Nero, which is synonymous with 50 letters. So 50 plus 616, excuse me, 50 plus 616 equals mathematically, somebody got a calculator, 666. So a lot of things that we think and I'm not saying whether that's the mark of the beast or not, but I'm just saying if you do a word study on Caesar Nero, Caesar Nero could literally be who John's talking about in the book of Revelation as the great beast. Because after all, he's killed Peter. He's killed Paul. He killed over 600 Christians on his lawn just to give him some light during a nighttime party. So what it, how we read things and the personality of the gift of the rev revelation describes how we receive it. Yes. And all I'm trying to tell you is that you have to read it for yourself to see the personality of the gift. Right, because when other folks give you a gift, you look for the personality. When Honey Baby done messed up. And he didn't do what he was supposed to do and he come in here with these flowers and chocolates and we evaluate the person now oh you ain't worth a dog <laughs> because what we have evaluated the personality of the gift and when God gives us certain gifts sometimes the problem with his revelation is he reveals things that we don't want to know and he shows us things that are uncomfortable to deal with and he reveals things in our lives that we must avoid and remove from our lives because they're toxic and cancerous in our lives. But because God's telling us this, we won't look at the personality of the gift. We won't look at the fact that God's trying to save us from something that's going to take us out of here, that's going to keep us from losing, from gaining sleep at night. All right, y'all just, I'm going to just keep on preaching and y'all. But there is a personality in the gift that Jesus Christ is trying to give. He wants us all to see it. It's very important because he's trying to get the disciples to understand that not only am I here for you, but I'm coming for a purpose that you can't understand. But I want you to also see that while I'm giving you a gift that you don't understand, not only is there a personality to it, but there's a permanence to this gift. The gift that God has given us throughout all time has had several personalities, but it's never been permanent. Because God has given us temples to worship him, but they have been destroyed. He has given us books and tablets with laws to keep, but they have been destroyed. He's given us a promised land where milk and honey should flow, where resources should be that we would never have to ask or beg again. But they have dried up. And been destroyed. God has given us gift after gift after gift. But now God's saying, I've got a gift that shall never move. I have a gift that shall never change. I have a gift that man can't take from you. This gift is salvation. And it's a permanent gift that I give to you. You won't be able to send your way out of this gift. You won't be able to lie your way out of this gift. You won't be able to cheat or steal out of this gift because time and time again, I gave the gift to Moses. You turn your back on Moses. I gave the gift to my prophets. You turn your back on my prophets. I gave the gift to Jesus and you tried to kill him too. But guess what? This time, this gift is permanent. I'm marking it through the end times up until now because I know just how bullheaded and stubborn you are. But because I love you, this gift shall last forever. The revelation that God has for you is a permanent gift to help you make your way through this thing called life. Do I have a witness in here? I thank God that it's a permanent gift because sometimes if it had just been a gift that God gave me haphazardly, I would have lost it and I spent the rest of my life trying to find it. But I'm so, so thankful to God that every time I get lost, I don't have to find God. But when I get lost, God is right there with me. Yeah. 
It's like the songwriter said, I once was lost, but was blind, but I thank you for the audience participation. This gift of revelation it is permanent. This gift of revelation, it is most certainly has its own personality. But the most important thing about it is that there's power in God's revelation. When God shows us things, it's not for coincidence, but because there's power attached to it. And the best thing about God's revelation is that it shows up in the darkest hour when we feel the most powerless. Some of us, when the clock struck 12.01 or 12 o'clock into the new year, there were a lot of people who went out of the last year feeling very powerless. Uh, Many of us, many of us, for different reasons, some of us because we were going through stress on our jobs, some of us stress in our home, some of us political anxiety, some of us were grieving and mourning, some of us were dealing with the entraptions of, of sin in our lives, and, and let's just be real, sometimes sin wears us out. It f- we're dealing with something that has not refuses to go away on talking about sin. I have, to, I have to preach about that every now and then. Uh, but the power and the gift of God's revelation says that no matter what we're dealing with, grieving with, or trying to hold on to, the power of God, whatever ails you. Me, if you're mourning, I can comfort you. If you're distressed, I can relieve you. If you are in a place of isolation, I can bring you back in. If you are lonely and uncomfortable, I can provide company and comfort both at the same time. Because God always reveals to us things that we need in the darkest time that we need them. Most of us will never be quenched by the satisfaction of God's revelation because we look for revelation in all the wrong places. Uh, There was a song that says, looking for love in all the wrong places. And, and, And because this isn't the love month, or, you know, February of last year, I'm talking about revelation. Some of you just flat out been looking for revelation in all the wrong places. You know, we, 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 we in very serious terms, we grieve the loss of Bishop Eddie Long this morning. But a lot of us were looking, and, and I know that may be a shock to some of you, but he was pronounced on CNN and credible news sources to have passed and expired from his long bout with cancer. And in trying to look for the truth of the matter, many of us, you know, we want to call people and ask folks, is Eddie Long really dead? Ask calling folks that don't know Eddie Long no more than you do. Asking everybody but an incredible source of information. Calling nieces and nephews. Calling people in your contact list that are in Atlanta, Georgia who don't even go to Eddie Long's church. When you can go to a credible source of information and find out for yourself. Now this is how it is with Revelation here in our lives. We need God to give us a word. We need God to give us a plan. But then we get on this thing right here, our iPhone Revelation 6, and we go to call in sister girl about some revelation and we end up calling our homeboys about some kind of revelation we want to if we really want a good source we call mama and grandmama for some revelation but God said it ain't no need of calling these people who need the same thing that you need but you gotta call on my name because I'm still alpha and omega I'm still the one who is who was and forever shall be. You ought to call my name because when you call on the name of the Father, the Father says that you can come and ask what you will and it shall be given unto you. Do I have anybody here that's waiting for God to unveil some of his most precious blessings? You've been waiting for God to keep things that were hidden from you and God, you're waiting for God to answer some prayers uh, that you've been waiting for the answer. Uh, I'm trying to tell somebody uh, that there ain't no need uh, 
and going to unviable sources. Uh, there is no need uh, to try to take it to the prayer line that's just as messy as your own mind. Uh, but I'm just trying to tell you that all you need to do uh, is get on your knees. Uh, the Bible does not say this, uh, but my grandmother used to say that we all have a telephone inside of our bosom. Uh, it only dials three numbers. Uh, one for the father. Uh, you may have heard this before. Uh, one for the son and one for the Holy Ghost and grandmama said that telephone in my bosom I can use it don't matter how many minutes I have but I can call him up and tell him what I want I wish I had somebody here that needed to call the Lord and tell him to see about your family somebody needs to call the Lord and say I need you to see about my physical condition somebody needs to call on Jesus and say Jesus I can't fix what I'm going through without your help but for everybody who knows the number for everybody that calls his name you know you got this thing in common every time you call him he answers by and by he don't come when you want him to come but for some strange reason he always comes right on time go ahead and act crazy if you want to i just need three people that know about my savior that know god won't let you down that know god has no failure that know god's a way out of no way tell somebody i tried them for myself and i know that god will take care of me tell somebody look at them in the eye and say neighbor oh neighbor god will He'll take care of you. He'll take care of you. He'll take care of you. He'll take care of everybody. He'll take care of you. I tried him. I tried him for myself. Everybody that's able, will you stand to your feet? I'm trying to tell you that I tried him. I know who he is. I'm not repeating what somebody told me. I know for myself that God will take care of you. You know, I um, was at a meeting yesterday. Thank you so much. I was at a meeting yesterday and we had a guest preacher. Who, what happened to my cameraman? Y'all just disregard and drop the ball in the ninth inning, but whatever the case may be. 